start with a little bit of tech trouble, but hopefully we're all set now. Um, it's a little hard to see you all, but I know you're there, and I really appreciate you taking the time to come out tonight. I know it's still a little bit of a risk to possibly be out and about these days, and I appreciate you trusting me and the museum with some of your time tonight. Um, thanks to Elizabeth, I know she ran back out to see if there's any stragglers. Um, so hope we're not too much in the way, but most of the important stuff will be on the side. Um, the Siege of Dairy is an important event to consider not only in the history of, as Elizabeth pointed out, the Ulster Scots community, which is a group I study, but also when we consider the entire island of Ireland's history. Um, it, in and of itself, it was a pretty important event at the time, which we'll definitely get into, although it also set the stage for the much more infamous and perhaps well-known um, Battle of the Boyne, which happened uh, a year or so after the siege ended. It also really challenged the idea that the glorious revolution in Britain was bloodless. That's something that especially people in England like to point out at the time, saying that the glory of it all was that a monarch was deposed and replaced quickly, quote unquote, diplomatically, and with little bloodshed, which may have been the, the situation in England itself or in Britain, but definitely not in Ireland. Um, before we get truly started, though, there is a few background details that I think will be good to get everyone on the same page. I hope you'll bear with me because they kind of jump around a little bit, but definitely if you have questions, we can go through them at the end a little bit more. It'll just hopefully set the stage for the wider talk. Um, and this picture before we move on is of Bishop's Gate in the city of Derry. It's actually looking from within the city walls outward. And this is the exact view that the fabled apprentice boys have had when they shut the gates on King James's troops at the beginning of the siege in December of 1688. So the first real background topic we want to discuss is the Stuart monarchy and the Royal House of Stuart. Um, you might actually know there's some interesting historical Stuart influence on not only America, but this place in particular. Um, King James II, who we'll be talking about more, he's down here on a postage stamp. Um, he was the Duke of York for which New York was named. Um, his subsidiary title, the Duke of Albany, referring to Scotland, was uh, the namesake of our capital city of Albany. As you likely know, before New York was a British colony, it was a Dutch one. And interestingly enough, James's nephew, son-in-law, and future rival, King William, who is included in the Stuart stamps here, was uh, the stadholder of the Dutch Republic at a time when Britain and the Netherlands were fighting over what became British New York, where we are right now. So for them, the Glorious Revolution was truly a family affair. However, the, Scottish, or the Stuart family was originally Scottish. The first Stuart king we have at the top there, King James I, was uh, the son of Mary, Queen of Scots. You might know that Mary was deposed herself and um, executed, and thus her son James actually became king at infancy. Um, he therefore was, of course, uh, assisted by actual adults at the time of his, his mother's death. And so, although Mary had originally spent most of her life in France and was a devout Catholic, James, who had been baptized Catholic by her, was ultimately raised in the Church of Scotland by his regents. Um, when Elizabeth I of England died, the Stuarts became heirs to the throne of England. And at that time, King James became King James I of England, although he was actually James VI of Scotland. So a lot of the Stuart monarchs throughout history have had to uh, write mill numbers because they have a different history within Scotland versus England. And that has a lot to do with the fact that while the Stuarts were ruling England, Scotland, and also Ireland at once, those kingdoms were not united. They all had the same ruler, but they all kept their domestic laws, customs, etc. So they were not united in the sense that the United Kingdom now is today, for instance. Um, but when the Stuarts took the throne of England, they had to become Anglicans, as the Church of England is the state church of England, and the monarch is the defender of the faith. Um, and it was also during the Stuart history that um, we had the Cromwellian period and the conquest, which ultimately led to the, the temporary abolition of the monarchy. So after the first King James, we had King Charles who was executed, followed by a period of no monarchs. Then when Charles II was restored to power, he actually had started to sort of flirt again with Catholicism. He and his younger brother James had spent the uh, Cromwellian period actually in exile in France with their cousins among them uh, King Louis XIV. And so Charles, who died sort of unexpectedly young, ended up converting to Catholicism on his deathbed, and James II became king. He had actually married and produced his daughters, Mary and Anne, were the final two stamps here, with his first wife, 
they were both raised Anglican, sort of at the direction of the British Parliament. But James's first wife died, and when he married again, he married a Catholic and soon became a Catholic himself. After that, he had a son, so all of a sudden there was a male heir who was Catholic, but poised to potentially inherit the British throne, which sent the British government into a bit of a crisis, considering the idea of having a Catholic monarch again was not something they would approve of or appreciate. But on top of that, the Stuart family as a whole had sort of historically not loved the idea of the monarch ruling alongside a parliament or with the help of parliament, so they had plenty of constitutional issues as well with James, not just his religion. As such, parliament actually invited in the late 1680s uh, King William, who we see again here, but once again, James's nephew, also his son-in-law, um, to come with Mary, James's daughter, to depose Mary's father from the throne and rule jointly over the kingdoms of England, Scotland, and Ireland. And that set up the William and James rivalry, which we'll talk about a little bit more. Um, additionally, though, one thing that we also need to sort of consider is that during the Stuart reigns, there was a time when all three kingdoms of theirs were at war. So there was the War of the Three Kingdoms, which included the English Civil War of the 1630s and 40s, the Scottish Civil War of around the same time, and then also the Irish Confederate Wars. The Irish Confederate Wars, I think, collectively lasted longer, but they sort of were in pieces or occurring in different places at different times. So one of the most egregious events of the Confederate Wars in Ireland were in 1641. Um, this event became sort of the bedrock of what was considered the, quote, Protestant trilogy of understanding Irish history. Um, the Catholic nobility at the time had been very disenfranchised by the arrival of Ulster Scots and English settlers under the direction of the British Crown, especially in Ulster. They were sent to plant the kingdom for Britain, for Protestantism, and a lot of other conflicts, including things like the Nine Years' War, had been going on with local Gaelic Irish. Um, and especially around the time of the flight of the Earls, uh, the British Crown treated anyone, any Catholic who had owned land who left as a forfeiture. That land was now the British Crown. So that was taken and rehanded out to these settlers. Um, and many of the Catholic nobility or former Catholic residents of that land that were still there were understandably quite annoyed by this. And so around 1641, they finally hatched a plan to seize Dublin Castle, um, take control of governmental administration in Ireland and return the lands, many of which went back even centuries at that point in certain families to the Catholic nobles or the Catholic population of Ireland as a sign of how much they rejected the imposition of the English language, the English religion, English law, etc., on Ireland. Um, one of the sort of side effects of this, of course, is that there, at that time were already some Protestant settlers in Ireland who had been there for, you know, 40, 50 years. And so they weren't super thrilled with the idea of having their lives offended through uh, redistribution of land, etc. So this rebellion included a lot of Protestant Catholic skirmishes, and one of the most egregious happened in uh, Portadown in County Armagh, these days officially in Northern Ireland, um, in which a number of Protestant civil civilians in the town were rounded up, tortured, stripped naked, and drowned in the river van. Um, so this was something that very, very clearly seared into the memory of the Protestant minority in Ireland, at, or at least especially in the Portadown area. Um, which sort of solidified negative relations between them and the Catholic population. And so these days when we think of people know about Protestant Buddhism, Orangism, et cetera, in Northern Ireland, they probably think a lot about how the main sort of celebration of that ideology or culture is the 12th of July. But until the 12th of July actually happened, um, the 23rd of October and this rebellion in 1641 was sort of the main event for them to uh, celebrate at the time. And finally, this one's quick. Um, it really doesn't affect probably anyone's true understanding of these events, but something that we probably don't think a lot about in this country since we're so young is that there's plenty of historical events that occurred under a different dating system than what we use today. Um, the Gregorian calendar was introduced by Pope Gregory actually in the late 1500s, but perhaps not shockingly, Protestant countries and Protestant empires were not super quick to adapt it. So um, Britain itself actually did not adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1752. So if you think about it, even that means some of the events in early history here in the Albany area or in the wider American colonies actually did not adopt the uh, sort of calendar shift until well after they had already been established and living here. Um, the shift, of course, was a result of better understanding of astronomy and you know the Earth's orbit and the seasons, et cetera. So 
that was ultimately calculated as the addition of 11 days between um, the Julian calendar, which of course dated from the Roman Empire. This, as I said, it's not probably going to make or break your understanding of the Siege of Derry, but I just pointed out because throughout folklore and commemoration of a lot of the events we might be talking about, there are differing dates listed or just quoted at certain times. Um, and this can just be confusing because obviously 11 days is a significant amount of time. It can be weird when you hear people talking about an event happening essentially two weeks either side of when it may have actually occurred. So for instance, um, talking about the 12th of July, as we all know, a lot of people in especially Northern Ireland celebrate that as the Battle of the Boyne, King William's victory over King James. But as we see here from this traditional orange songbook, the famous song, The Boyne Water, actually quotes the, the battle as happening on July the 1st. And that's of course because 1690, when the battle occurred, was before the adoption of the Gregorian calendar. But when you add 11 days from July the 1st, you get July the 12th. Similarly, um, we're here tonight to talk about the siege and relief of Derry because Derry was officially relieved on the 1st of August, 1689. And if you add 11 days of that, you get 11 or 12, depending on whether or not you're quoting the 31st date when the last ship sailed into uh, Derry's harbor or the day after when officially the siege was considered over. Um, similarly, the idea of shutting the gates in December officially happened on the 7th of December, but a lot of uh, folk tradition, including another song, another orange song, the Crimson Banner quotes it as having happened on the 18th. So that just hopefully explains why you might hear different dates. I tried very hard to use just the old style because I think it's probably clearer, but if you've ever heard an orange song or you've seen a mural or other things like that that might have the 18th or the 11th or 12th of August, that's why. So now we're into it. Okay. So shutting of the gates, uh, to, after William had come over with his wife Mary, James's daughter, to take the throne of England, um, he quickly moved on to uh, the other venues of Stuart rule. Um, because of the way the Parliament was working in, in England and Scotland, he was very popular there, and of course that's again where the idea of a glorious and bloodless revolution took place. But Ireland was a very different story. As we all know, of course, the native population of Ireland was majority Catholic. The Protestant Reformation really didn't work out there despite Britain's best efforts. So a lot of people were fans of the now Catholic King James and were willing to support him in his quest to return to the throne and he therefore viewed Ireland as the perfect place to launch his comeback. However, it wasn't 100% uniform and so there were some parts, Derry being one of them and the other city, Enniskillen, as another that were really resistant to James's uh, conquest or reconquest. And um, so James's Lord Deputy, uh, Lord Turconnell, was actually set out to sort of go to these cities, which were really just ports at the time, you know, wall garrisons, and replace any people that they were, uh, that they thought were threats or resisting James's attempts to take back his throne and exchange them for people who were loyal to James. Um, that probably seemed like a pretty mean feat in a place like Derry, which was majority Ulster Scots, Presbyterian, and Anglican. Um, but the city's location, especially up in the northwest on Loch Boyle, was really crucial to this plan working out. So James and his deputy thought it was worth the risk. Um, however, from sort of the get-go, they were uh, deterred by some things that just happened to occur around the same time. One of them was an interesting, now considered to be fake news type story, the Comber Letter, which was a rumor that circulated around, especially the village of Comber in County Down which stated that on the 9th of December, 1688, a 1641-esque massacre would happen again, and the Catholic population of the area was going to rise against the Protestants once again, and that people would have to remember what it was like to see their loved ones 40-ish years earlier, tortured, bound, drowned, what have you. And surprisingly, given the technology or, or lack thereof at the time, that letter traveled very quickly. And so plenty of people had heard about this rumored massacre. Um, around the time that James was really starting to launch his comeback. So it just so happened um, around this time, across what is now Northern Ireland, across Ulster, in the Derry area, Tyrconnell was trying to uh, take, take the garrison of the city. And he did this by raising an army known as the Red Shanks. They were all Jacobite supporters. A lot of them were actually Scottish Highlanders, but also Glensmen from the Antrim Glens. Um, and they were sent out to march up to the, the walls of Derry and sort of barge in and take over the city. However, when they reached there around the 6th or the 7th, or the 7th of December, uh, plenty of people in Derry had already heard about the rumors of the Congress letter, 
when the army arrived, people were very untrusting and they didn't know what to think or what to do. Interestingly enough, the residents of the city were pretty much divided along denominational lines. So the Anglicans and um, some of their clergy, who had a high position of political leadership at the time as well, argued that the Red Shanks should be allowed into the city because they were the soldiers of the king. Um, even if people didn't believe that James should, should be the king, he had a claim to the throne. Um, and that meant something to them. However, many of the Presbyterians argued that the troops should be kept out because nothing good could come from allowing an army into a city where they could be locked in. Um, so there actually was a lot of indecision at the time, and before anyone really could take further action, 13 apprentice boys, all Presbyterians, rushed to the Ferry Key Gate in the city of Derry and shut it in the face of the Red Shanks. Um, so here, sorry, I'm looking at the wrong way. This is a mural from um, the waterside area of the city of Derry. Um, I actually don't know how old it is, but it's clearly relatively, relatively modern. Um, on the side of the house, for anyone who doesn't know, uh, mural culture is very big in Northern Ireland. People uh, paint political signs, political slogans, historical events onto the walls of even of their own private homes, as you see here. And this one um, actually depicts probably not all 13 apprentice boys, but a fair number of them shutting the gates in uh, this major development in James's attempt to take back the throne. Um, so. so interestingly enough, as dramatic as it all sounds, after that happened, really nothing major took place for a while. Um, today, a lot of people see the start of the siege as being that day, the 7th of December, old style. But actually, as soon as the gates were shut, it wasn't really any huge confrontation or anything. Um, it was a relatively quiet winter in the city. Um, the governor of Derry at the time, Robert, Robert Lundy, had urged the residents of the city to spend their winter preparing for war, stocking up uh, defenses, preparing the cannons, etc., but not really acting. Um, there wasn't really any provocation to act at the time either. Um, so they figured they would do their best to be prepared and maybe actually things might just go away. Um, on the 23rd of December, James actually uh, fled again to France. He was hoping his cousin, the influential son king, Louis XIV, would be able to provide him with some money and some troops and perhaps some uh, assistance in uh, how to attack the city. And so he was gone until early spring of 1689, around on the 12th of March, he and 5,000 French troops and generals landed on that same sail down in South County Cork, um, and they started to march north. Um, so within a couple days, they'd actually reached, uh, again, County Down, this village called Dremore. And on the 14th of March, they had a pretty quick and pretty handily defeated uh, Williamite supporters in Dremore. It was called the Break of Dremore. Break being a Scottish word or an Ulster Scots word for a route, because that's really what it was. They quickly defeated Williamite troops and then moved on northeast to Lisburn and then on to Belfast, taking those both for James before sweeping west to hopefully Derry and Enniskillen. Besides this, they moved so quickly because pretty much everywhere else was already willing to support James and actually sort of welcomed him back to Ireland, so there wasn't a lot of resistance besides these sort of outcrops in the Northwest. Um, however, of course, it, nothing's ever 100% picture perfect, so there were some Williamite supporters and some Protestant civilians who were living in places like Cav and Monaghan and then the cities of Dungannon in County Tyrone and Coleraine up in Northeast County, Derry, London Derry, depending on how you, how you do it. Um, who were urged by Governor Lundy to flee into Derry because of course the city was walled in. So if people felt like they were gonna be uh, sort of sacrificed or put in harm's way by being on the outsides of the city, they were urged to come in and shelter there inside the city's walls. So um, there was this mass exodus and the city would probably have like maybe five to six or thousand residents on a normal day. All of a sudden, the population swelled, and some estimates go up to as much as 20,000 people were now all inside the city, inside the city's walls. Um, and so, about a month after the, the break of Tremor, James's army met Governor Lundy and his troops from the city of Derry on the River Finn, which is outside um, the city of Strabane, which is just a little bit south of the city of Derry. Um, and that was another handy defeat for the Jacobites because Lundy fatally left a number of spots along his side of the bank undefended which gave the Jacobite army pretty quick places where they could identify, push through, and cross the river toward the city of Derry. Um, and so this photo here is um, a lambic drum. This is actually a drum in the, the Siege Museum in Derry, which is a great visit for anyone. I highly recommend it when things are less crazy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, lambic drums are really important to uh, unionist culture, Protestant culture, loyalist culture. 
Um, they're huge, 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 uh, often handmade drums, and they're always pretty much decorated with some sort of memorial or cultural image. So this one, I know it's sort of hard to see at the top here, but it actually says a tribute to the Brave 13, the 13 being the apprentice boys. Um, the middle picture is a picture of a cannon, which as we see on the bottom here is called Roaring Meg. It was a famous cannon from the siege. Um, and then at the bottom, there's the famous sort of uh, siege of Derry Cry, No Surrender. And it's a little hard to see here because of the edges of the image, but we also actually see, given the ultra fast nature of, of this area, lots of thistles around the picture of the cannon. And then on the edges, it's like an orange lily with a thistle in the center. So the idea of Scotland is still very prevalent in this, even though we're dealing with places and events that happened in Ireland. Um, all right, so officially, officially, the siege began on the 18th of April after the, the skirmish on the Finn. Um, James's troops were able to march to the city of Derry and James himself actually arrived at Bishop's Gate on the 18th, demanding surrender. He told the people that he would give them their lives, they'd have their lands, and they'd be able to keep their faith and they'd also be pardoned for all quote unquote past offenses. So they wouldn't be in trouble for any of the events that had taken place in the winter. Um, Governor Lundy quickly urged surrender because he thought that was a pretty good deal and having worked with his men to try to deter the Jacobite army just a few days prior, didn't think that the city would hold out against them. They thought they were just too much. Um, and so uh, the citizens quickly asked Lundy for suggesting that because they wanted to hold out. They did not want to surrender. Lundy himself actually ended up having to flee in disguise in the middle of the night for even suggesting the surrender. And these days, this is another photo from the siege exam. Um, some people who celebrate the shutting of the gates in December actually burned Lundy in effigy as a traitor for doing so. Um, and quickly, two joint governors were appointed in his place. Um, James himself actually quickly left for Dublin. He actually expected that as soon as he showed up, the people would say, okay, you're the king, we got it we'll surrender, you give us a gate, you give us a good deal, and that's it. So he didn't really have a plan beyond that. And he also didn't come with much weaponry, so it was hard to um, ensure that he had any way to defend himself if things got violent. So he decided to flee to Dublin, left his plans in the hands of his French generals and other generals, and um, hoped that things would work out. <laughs> this, on the 21st of April, the Jacobite troops started bombarding the city walls and um, planned to keep doing so as long as it took. While inside the city of Derry, the supply situation was getting very dire. As we recall from the slide earlier, the normal sized population had skyrocketed with refugees and already being a walled city that sort of relied on being able to go in and out to get to the, the, you know, the rivers and the, the locks and everything to secure supplies were all instantly cut off. So it started to look pretty bad pretty quickly. Um, uh, although the city, of course, itself was locked and everyone who was a civilian was sort of stuck in place, um, there were some skirmishes between Williamite <coughs> forces and Jacobite forces outside the city's walls. Um, Williamites got a solid victory at this area called Pennyburn, which is sort of to the northwest of the city of Derry, and then in a nearby location also known as Windmill Hill. Um, there was a sort of back and forth seeming stalemate until Jacobite Brigadier General uh, Ramsey ended up killed there. So um, all of a sudden the tide was really turning in the favor of the Williamites, although it was still slow going. Um, by the end of May, about 3,000 Jacobite troops had died. Um, again, inside the walls, food was getting very scarce, disease is spreading. Uh, the main sort of a plan of attack for the Jacobite army at this time was to just starve the city into submission. They built a boom in Loch Foyle to work as a blockade for any ships that might try to come in as relief. Um, Residents had resorted to eating things like rats, mice, whatever vermin they could find because they couldn't get supplies from the outside since they didn't want to open their gates. Um, and then sort of, I don't know if this was really intended or not, but if you sort of read the history of, as it is now, it seems like there was actually a lot of psychological warfare going on. Um, this part itself may have not been intentional, but for instance, on 13th of June, 1689, um, a relief fleet actually did come up Loch Foyle attempting to relieve the city of Derry, but they saw the boom that the Jacobites had placed in the water and figured that it would be completely impassable. In, in, real, in real terms, it actually wasn't that bad. It definitely was not super, super flimsy, but it was not as bad as this fleet was expecting. So they dropped anchor in the lock for a few days, but then decided to turn back because they didn't see any way forward. Um, similarly, 
there were more fake news going around the city of Derry, including letters saying that there was another fleet right behind them that would be there in a few days, and that all they had to do was just wait a little bit longer, um, even though that did not seem to be based in any fact. And then finally, actually, some Jacobite soldiers would find uh, Williamite supporters from other areas that were stuck outside the walls of the city, sometimes even do things like strip them naked and walk them up to the gates and tell the people of the city, look, your brethren are out here starving, they're naked, they need, they need shelter, they need food, aren't you going to let them in? And thought that if the, Jack or the Williamites did so, that they would be able to charge the gates and, and storm the city. But the residents of Derry said, absolutely not. Sorry, but we're not gonna let you in. We just can't take the risk. Um, so that really solidified this idea of no surrender, which is still a very common theme in things like land bank drums and other Protestant Unionist loyalist imagery even to this day. But finally, um, things started to look up in July. Um, around the 13th of July, there was actually negotiations for a truce between the Jacobites and the Williamites. However, it fell apart very quickly, and on the 14th, the Jacobite army started re-bombarding the city. Um, however, it was only about two more weeks until we reached the 100th day of the siege, the 28th of July, old style. Um, and a, a new fleet was seen in Loch Foyle. Um, it also sort of was trying to judge the boom situation as perhaps maybe being worse than it was, but they dropped anchor and they were waiting for positive weather that might help propel them forward so that they could break the boom with things like nature instead of having to hack at it full force just with manual labor. Um, within a day or so, the lead ship, the Mountjoy, was able to use the winds and the tide to propel itself forward and break the boom alongside some uh, sailors in uh, longboats, which were much closer to the surface of the water that were hacking away at the boom with axes and picks, etc. all under heavy cannon and musket fire as the Jacobite army had actually staged itself along the, both sides of the lake and were firing out this ship trying to get through. Uh, but they succeeded and uh, the Mount Joy itself was able to get into port in Derry and relieve the city. Um, similarly, uh, back at the beginning of the siege, uh, after Derry had shut its gates, the city of Enniskillen also had done the same. Um, they were also holding out against the Jacobite army, and on July 31st, old style, the Battle of Newton Butler occurred, um, which was really, although maybe perhaps less dramatic, the real end of the, the situation for the Jacobite army. Um, this battle, Enniskillen, actually, if you've ever heard the traditional orange song, The Sash. It talks about battle that Derry, Ockram, and Eskillen, and the Boyne, uh, the Boyne and Ockram being the two that happened in 1690 and 1691 that really ended the war. But the references in that song to Derry and Eskillen are these two events that we've talked about here. Um, overall, in the siege, uh, the governors of the city at the time were writing a lot of letters and a lot of notes and journals, and so they estimated that the soldier deaths throughout the 105 days of the siege were 3,000 soldiers from Derry dead. Um, there was no possible way for them to count the full extent of the civilian deaths, but modern historians calculate that as being anywhere from potentially 4,000 to 10,000 civilian deaths in 105 days. Um, although James himself stayed in Ireland and continued to uh, perpetuate his campaign, most famously probably at the Boyne where he and William met face to face with their troops, um, on July 1st, old style, 1690. Um, this really spelled the end. He obviously did fight for about another two years, or his army fought for another two years, but nothing was ever as good for them after the siege as it was before in terms of support. Um, and so they did not have the sort of unified forces they hoped they would going forward to events, especially after the Boyne, um, and even things like the siege of Limerick at a later time. Um, so we have, oh, sorry, we got the wrong side. Um, another mural from the Waterside area of Derry. This is the Mount Joy, um, clearly a really old, crazy sort of constructed uh, huge ship trying to come into the city. It's really hard to see, I think, this, this close, but the boom is there. It's painted actually really, really small and it does look really flimsy. Obviously, it's just artistic representation, but it's hard to imagine something with today's technology deterring people for that long. Um, and then this also quotes the Brave 13, and if we have on here, uh, the names of the 13 of Francis Boyne, and anyone who is really up to date on any sort of genealogy or family history might recognize a fair number of these names as very common Scottish last names, which again shows the Ulster South connection here. Um, so commemorating the siege has actually been different at different times in the history of Ireland since. Um, a lot of people have argued that this event was so heroic and spectacular that it was commemorated publicly with massive enthusiasm right from, you know, one year on, but that's actually not the case. 
Um, at first, people very much view this as something that it should be reflected on privately. Um, maybe you might go to a church service on the 12th of August to uh, recognize the relief of Darien, and then again at around the 18th of December for using the new special dates for the shutting of the gates. Um, a lot of the early sort of private reflection on this event likely had to do with the fact that although the Anglicans and the Presbyterians of the city of Darien were united in propelling out James's forces, they actually still had a lot of denominational differences and um, did not really get along or see eye to eye themselves very much. This actually changed a lot with the formation of Impractice Boys Dairy Clubs. Um, these days are actually Impractice Boys Clubs throughout the world, including places like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, etc. Um, but they really helped bridge this denominational divide, and that sort of allowed for this event to become more publicly commemorated. By the centenary in 1788, actually a parade through the city of Derry uh, took place where Anglicans, Presbyterians, and Catholics all marched together to Derry Church of Ireland or Anglican Cathedral for a special memorial service to mark 100 years on. Um, at this time, the siege is viewed as a victory over tyranny and for religious freedom, so no one theoretically had anything wrong to say about that concept. It was pretty universal. Um, and interestingly enough, when you think about the founding of this country and our own history, we hear a lot of similarities between how we think of our country declaring its independence or even just the settlement of uh, Europeans in this area. A lot of them were seeking freedom from tyranny and freedom of religion. So we see a lot of similarities there. Uh, something definitely to ponder when we think as well about how many Ulster Scots came to this country and actually had a lot to do with declaring independence in America and fighting in the American Revolution. Um, but by the early 1800s, the shift from commemorating the relief as the major sort of single event of the siege was made and more people started beginning to celebrate either just the shutting of the gates in the winter or both. Um, by the late, or mid to late 1800s though, a lot of the ideology or iconology around the siege had changed. It was now pretty much solely a celebration for people who viewed the victories as victories specifically for Protestantism, not for religious tolerance. Um, it, interestingly enough, ongoing parades and uh, public events were never prosecuted under the Party Secessions Act in Ireland because they were viewed as civic in this case rather than political. Um, in 1850, the British Parliament had passed the Party Secessions Act banning all sort of sectarian events in Ireland after a year earlier when some orange men and some ribbon men met in Dolly's Bray, again in County Down, and um, clashed on the 12th of July there, ending up with, um, I think, roughly 30, 30 people dead. Um, but because the city itself was commemorating the city's history, the uh, Apprentice Boys events were never never considered to be needing to be banned, at least. Um, however, in much more recent history, the idea of sectarianism and um, triumphalism definitely played a role in more recent history. Um, as you might all know, the Battle of the Bogside, which is thought, thought of as being one of the first major events of what became the Troubles, kicked off as a confrontation between apprentice boys marching on the walls of Derry and Catholic residents of the Bogside who didn't want what they thought as an uh, intimidating or threatening presence coming through their areas. Um, in the 1820s, a statue of one of the governors of Derry throughout the siege, Governor Walker, had been placed on the walls of the city. Um, but in 1973, it was actually uh, destroyed by an IRA bomb, which is something that we think of perhaps being sort of related to these ideas of public history and what we're seeing now with removals of statues and what it means to put up memorials or statues or just any sort of architecture that might imply a certain agenda. Um, and then finally, what we still possibly hear a lot about even today, 20 years on from the Good Friday Agreement, especially in Derry, but within the wider uh, communities of Northern Ireland, is this idea of the siege mentality, um, which really shows that there's still perhaps maybe not the greatest uh, establishment of trust between the Catholic and uh, nationalist um, uh, Republican communities and the Protestant Unionist Loyalist communities. Um, and while, of course, it's never justified to you know, discriminate or maybe say you don't trust someone because they're this religion or they're this ideology politically. It's sort of understandable when you see a literal wall still between the majority Catholic area of the city and the majority Protestant of the city. Um, Derry's walls even today are some of the most preserved in Europe. I mean, actually, if you've gone there, um, you probably know this. You can actually walk walk them in full. It takes only about 45 minutes tops, probably, which shows you how small the city was for those up to 20,000 people that were living there at the time of the siege. But it was a very small area that over time as technology grew really quickly extended beyond what was once the fort 
Um, so if we see the events of the siege, while well, maybe not the thing that people think of the first second they get up in the morning, they still play out in these communities a lot, um, especially, of course, throughout the troubles when there, of course, was sectarian violence. Um, this mural is actually in inside the walls. It's hard to see, obviously, when you're there because it is big enough to sort of distort your perception. But if you look into the city from the walls of Derry, you very clearly from one of the, um, I guess, sort of windows <laughs> where a, a barrel of a cannon would be pointing out, um, you see this mural which talks about the loyalist community perhaps believing they are still under siege. Derry's uh, Protestant population is actually very, very small these days, um, having always been sort of the national nationalist majority city to counteract Belfast's unionist majority city for so long. Um, and so people still very much have it at the forefront of their mind, which especially for us in the US with not very much history behind us, it might seem a little weird to be ruminating on events that are 400 plus years, 300 plus years in the past, um, but it still, it means a lot to people. Um, and you can definitely argue whether or not it should or shouldn't, but the fact of the matter is that it, it does sort of still play a role. And I think this is actually behind the scenes in the decorations. This is like a wall outside, like a daycare center. Or a kids, a kids club. Interestingly enough, you can probably read a fair amount into it. Um, but that's pretty much it. Um, we'll definitely go to questions, but first, I would love to take a minute to not only thank Elizabeth for inviting me, but just to give her a little hand for all the work that she's put in while we've been. <laughs> On lockdown, I know she's been working really hard on a very small budget and small staff to get the museum up and running. I know it's probably going to be a while yet, just because we're also not really supposed to be in big groups, but it's looking awesome, and that's really exciting. Um, some of the photos I got were from doing field work at the Siege Museum, which I mentioned, and at the Ulster Stock Agency in Belfast, and then some uh, final photos came actually off the extra mural activity blog, which is really cool. And it, you can look at murals of literally anything across Northern Ireland, and it's it's really well done and awesome. And then you all for again taking hopefully not a huge risk by coming out tonight but i really appreciate you doing so um and yeah we'll do the bibliography <laughs> and then questions uh, okay yeah. thank you <laughs> Like it now because we have so much technology which of course is just that much more brutal 
but siege warfare was very common and actually, I don't know if it was preferred, but it, it was a functional way to do war because it just took so much time otherwise to load, or load a gun or to load a cannon. You, you know, we hear about it, we learn about the, you know, the revolution here. Um, I'm from Saratoga, so of course the Battle of Saratoga, just the time it took to load a gun and fire it again um, was really not advantageous to, to like like hand-to-hand -hand combat, I guess you could say, because it was so long that people could easily kill you <laughs> just in the process of they're prepared and you're not. Um, but also a lot of this was because James just didn't show up with the right weapons or the right plan. He just figured like, these people are in Ireland. They Ireland recognizes me as the king, so I'll just show up, tell the ones that are the, like, you know, the biggest holdouts that they'll be fine if they give up now, they'll have their lives, they'll have their land, and that'll be that. But the people took it very differently. And so I think it was probably a last minute decision to start bombarding and then fighting. And then once you're into it, it's kind of like, in traction for over 100 days. <laughs> well, I guess you, you had mentioned that they had, were parading relatives of those who Yeah, exactly. Died, yeah. Hoping the door would open. Exactly. So they could barge in. Exactly. Back. And I know there's different heights for. Right, people, yeah. But a ladder. That, I think, yeah. Also, I mean, it's hard to see now. And I, I mean, there are multiple gates, of course, on the walls. This is just the one that was probably the most important at the front. but. If you, you know, the area is the bog side, it's called the bog side because at the time it was a literal log. Like there was, they, I, I don't actually remember when, but it was actively drained to build houses there. So the amount of available land that we might be imagining outside the walls, especially as faces, the end slide that I showed with, um, I'll go quickly back. Um, like this area, this is the bog side, but that literally was all underwater. So in terms of how much approach you have, you can kind of see, and if you've been there, you know, this is actually a pretty staunch walk up a hill. Um, but besides, I'm guessing probably the hill was still there because of the elevation, but everything else was a swamp. Um, so I'm not sure how much land there was available to, to do that, but I'm also not a military historian. I don't really know much about strategy or anything, so I can't say 100% that that's their thinking. They probably you up in a big Yeah, I think, I think just, I mean, understandably in any area you think about, even like, of course these days with modern technology, like individual houses like in New Orleans and stuff are built really, really high up because of flooding. Um, having a natural hill like this is a good place to plant a city in an otherwise boggy area um, for the same reasons that kept things relatively dry, or at least not as bad as they could be, although when you're stuck in there for 105 days. Um, so you said there were 3,000 get killed? Um, by the end of May, yeah. By the end of May. Yeah. How many were, how, how large was the army? Um, it was it was big. Like I actually, unfortunately, I, I want to say like maybe 20-ish thousand or more. I, I know um, a solid chunk did come from France. Um, so they had 20,000 inside the walls were 14, 15. Yeah, and it really was, if you think about it, maybe perhaps we as Americans, it does, it's like that similar ideology of like the underdogs fighting, you know, the greatest of the greats, because James did have this massive army. He was being funded by other monarchs that he was related to. He had a lot of supporters that were, you know, militiamen, just civilians that were willing to fight, and he still couldn't do it. <laughs> um, which I think is probably why in the Protestant Unionist memory this really looms large, because although they've been much more dominant in the past than they are now, they've always been a minority, and they've always been relatively small, especially when you consider the whole island. But for through very you know undemocratic means throughout centuries, they've been able to hold on, at least in certain places. So this idea of being able to um, do that here under such harsh conditions, the um, Protestant trilogy I was mentioning at the beginning is sort of a, it's a I guess you could say, especially if you understand like um, Calvinism, Presbyterianism, which is very into covenants and devotion, that whole idea, the 1641 uh, rising, um, the siege, and then the Battle of the Boyne were all seen as like major religious like events that were rewarding Protestants for who they were, for holding out, for not questioning God. Um, some of these other traditional orange songs, especially about the siege, talk about um, how they knew the Lord was on their side and stuff like that, it was seen as very much, um, a, I guess, proof from God that they were doing the right thing. Um, of course, that can be debated until the cows come home, but um, for them at that time, that's really what they were thinking, especially because even though at that time they had really built up, especially Ulster, to be in their control and in, 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 their, in their image, they, of course, faced resistance because they were always a smaller community than the native population. Uh, that's a really interesting point. I went to a Sunday school called Sound Women, <coughs> in, um, in the range of the Greek, mm -hmm. and it talks about the, it's like a Salem witch trials, um, 
but how their religious yeah. ideas, like that you know, you're a twain, twain, you're one of the has a professor here, and yeah. it's so different from the Catholic. Yeah, I just, I just, you know, that probably the devil is in you, <laughs> and he's not just definitely from the city. Yeah. You know? And so it's, it's this whole predestination thing which Catholics don't really have. Yeah. So I never really thought about that in terms of, you know, the no surrender. Right. It's because God is telling you don't surrender. Yeah. So it's, it's this feeding loop in itself that kind of keeps it alive. It's an interesting way. It does, it does. And it seems, I mean, there are, of course, throughout history of people of similar faith. I don't know if I could ever count myself among them necessarily. I'm not upset to say that. But the idea of covenants throughout, especially Northern Ireland's history, like um, at the home rule crisis in, in 1912, the worst of the three home rule crises, um, that's when Carson infamously rounded up as many Presbyterians and Anglicans at the time as he could find the Unionist community largely in Northern Ireland and had them all sign a document, some in their own blood, saying, you know, we are not allowing home rule. We are not being separated from the Westminster Parliament in London. This is this is our like our birthright to be part of this empire or this kingdom and this is how we feel about it. And because we actually have the covenant, it seems maybe a little bit weird to us because also I don't know if any of them thought much beyond doing this. Like the symbolism of the act is great, but you know, what did that document actually do? But that didn't stop people from going to their uh, Presbyterian meeting houses or their Anglican churches throughout, even places like um, Catherine and Monaghan and Donegal, which are in Ulster but not in Northern Ireland now. But there was a large turnout from especially Presbyterian communities in those areas to sign the covenant. Um, I think and women signed it, so they yeah. didn't even vote. I mean, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, and so it really, I think, being able to play on that idea, or maybe it was framing that very complex political situation in terms of at least what the Presbyterian community could understand, mm -hmm. um, because they are still, um, I think a lot of people maybe think that historically in Ireland, especially in the Republic, we've seen the influence of the Catholic Church even recently with things like gay marriage and abortion, but if you look at the island as a whole, maybe, I don't know if it's one out the other, but it's definitely at least matched by the Presbyterians, um, at least in the North, who are traditionally, you know, people who don't drink, uh, the DUP, which is the Free Presbyterian Church political party. Not everyone who's in that party, of course, subscribes to this, but traditionally it was for people who didn't drink. You know, you don't socialize with the opposite sex. You probably don't, as a woman, dress with dresses that don't have sleeves. Um, and that's like, there are people, probably not as many as in the past, but there are people who worship in those churches today who still believe that that's the way to go, um, even in 2020. sports or anything, but um, East Belfast, which is traditionally the most unionist, most Protestant part of the city of Belfast because it was nearest to the dockyards and the ships, they just um, formed their own Gaelic Athletic Association Club, and it's been really cool, but it's also been um, somewhat controversial. Um, there's a lot of people who have resisted it because of the history of the GAA not allowing anyone who served in the British <laughs> Army to play. Um, you wouldn't play soccer. You couldn't. No, and it, it, that was always, I mean, that could be a whole other presentation, but like there were plenty of Catholic Irish nationalists who served in the British Army because they needed a paycheck and they weren't really getting many other opportunities. Mm -hmm. So it was hurting more than just the Unionist community or the, the Loyalist community. However, um, Linda Irwin, who is the Protestant Irish language activist, I don't know if any of you know about her, but she's awesome. Um, she actually is the president of the club and she very recently was talking about how like she grew up in East Belfast, probably the, the heart of the most Unionist part of East Belfast. Um, I think she's Methodist, um, but she talks about how like these days you can't say okay, well my family was always Protestant or my family was always Catholic, and this was like maybe the one time they married in, intermarried or whatever. Like um, that that history is it's very very rich and it goes back very very far, and a lot of people you know especially with places like Cavan, um, which did not have the same level of migration as say Antrim and Down, which are you know is where Belfast is, or into the Foyle Valley, which is. Uh, Derry, Londonderry, and um, Tyrone. Um, there were some people that were sent there or who went there, but they weren't in the same numbers. So if they're going to live there, it's a very good chance they're going to meet a Catholic person. Yeah. Um, and despite what you know, people have tried to do for probably millennia in some way, shape, or form, the idea of, of love doesn't really yeah. 
stop at a denominational border. <laughs> so how did you get married? I mean, when I was young, it was looked down upon. Yeah. You could, you know, Catholics could not marry yeah. another, you know, unless they were converted. And some people did, obviously. A lot of times, I'm not sure, depending on how rural your area was, you might just be able to, like, get married. And, like, that's as far as you needed to go. You didn't necessarily need to go to, like, a, a records office or uh, anything, like, legally formal. Um, the, um, I'm trying to think, I don't remember, I, I think there were some uh, intermarriage laws, but I don't remember. So like in the early 1800s, would they have been able to get married in Canada? Probably, I know yeah. they went to Scotland. Yeah, um, a lot of people, either, some people um, would, I don't know if this is getting your head, but some people would marry, keep their denomination separate, and then the idea was that if they had, say like the husband was Protestant and the wife was Catholic, the boys would be raised Protestant, the girls would be raised Catholic. Anyone who was eligible to inherit land would be the Protestant faith because that was the ascendant faith. Um, it's interesting to point out that on the entire island of Ireland, the only religion that was ever the formal state church was the Church of Ireland. The Catholic Church was never a state religion, um, although clearly it was very close in terms of legal documents and policy throughout Ireland's early independent history, um, especially around the time of de Valera. He really wanted uh, the New Republic or the Free State, it was as it was called at the time, to be aligned with Catholicism, but didn't want to go so far as to write a constitution that said the state religion of this place is Catholicism and this is how it's going to work. Uh, so he got really, really close to doing that without ever having to actually do it in terms of how policy was implemented. But um, it's a little bit more lax, and especially in rural areas um, where there's not necessarily a lot of administration going on because there's just not a lot of people. You probably could could do it, or the idea of marriage was not a legal thing. It was like maybe you, you had a party at someone's house that you got to know after a few years and decided to get married and then all of a sudden you just like lived together and had a family. Like yeah. probably by today's standards, we wouldn't consider that marriage. Legally, it wouldn't be considered marriage, but if you didn't have like a, a, a town hall or a village hall or anything to go to, if you lived on these you know estates, you just got married at home, mm -hmm. you know, had your, had your babies at home, did all of that. So it didn't really. Yeah, I just find it so hard to believe that a Catholic would do that without being blessed by the church. I think, well, I think, I think the idea of religion as well, like, of course, to a lot of people, especially in the idea of the plantation and then, say, the creation of the ultimate Republic of Ireland, like, the idea of faith was very tied to the, the founders of, or the establishers of those sentiments. So everyday people didn't necessarily, um, like, um, have it be such a thing, um, especially, uh, perhaps it's less likely that um, Presbyterians would be marrying Catholics, but Anglicans, you know, there's a lot of people within the Protestant community who sort of criticize Anglicanism as being Catholic light or not Protestant enough. So it really, there was some very specific differences, of course, okay. but they're not, it's not the idea of like, like Anglicans still have saints. Mm -hmm. They still have feast days. If you've ever gone, there's actually um, some really pretty Dutch Reformed churches in this area, of course, because of the Dutch history and Dutch Reformed faith is also Calvinist. If you've ever gone, I know actually in Scotia there's a really pretty Dutch Reformed church, and if you go in there, it's like, you know, your whitewashed wall, plain windows, there's like a choir loft, uh, wooden pews, etc. But then if you go to like the Cathedral of All Saints, which is the Anglican Cathedral up the hill there, yeah. it's Anglican, but it doesn't really look that different in interior than um, whatever, I can't remember the, the name of the Catholic one, but the one that's like across Albany, which is the Catholic Cathedral. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you're right, yeah. I always think All Saints is actually the Catholic one for some reason. I don't know why I confuse the names, but those, they're, they're very much their own places, but they don't really look starkly different on the inside. Um, and the idea of a very simple, like, it's just you and God, no, no, no intercessors, no need to go crazy with the, the gold leaf or anything, that's a very Calvinist um, and Presbyterian approach to things. So Anglicans probably didn't find that much difference between the Catholic faith and the Protestant faith that they practiced, although for others it probably seemed very starkly different. And now the Catholics, sorry, okay. um, you know, sometimes jump, they were pretty yeah. during famines. Yeah, yeah. So, like, a lot of Catholics jump or turn, yeah. like, Protestants were hit by the Yeah. So, you know, and then come back and go, you know, what's the yeah. Yeah. super level? Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is. Yeah. Did they call them supers? Supers, yeah. 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 Super. yeah. A lot of people, like, um, I'm Outing my family here, but in terms of my Irish Irish ancestry, I have only Anglo Irish and Scots Irish, so yeah. lots of Protestants, <laughs> and um, I'm privileged to know about them because they actually were pretty big deal. And so I would not be shocked to know that some of them were probably. I, there's actually a strong clerical tradition in my side of the, my Irish side of the family as well, and I would not be shocked to find out that some of them were probably doing the thing where they went out to poor Catholic communities and said, "Okay, convert here, yeah. and you'll, you'll get fed," which yeah. is a horrifically perverse situation to put in front of somebody. Yeah. Um, but when it's literally life or death, 
Mm -hmm. You might do it if you haven't been able to eat in you know four weeks because there's no food around. Mm -hmm. so, I'm gonna go here and then I'll go back. To <laughs> Uh, can we go back to like thinking of a forty-year-old yeah, yeah. plantation of land? Yeah. Or the plantation of oak. Yeah. The land that was seized. Yeah. Was that which belonged to the Earl who left that. Right. But the people who were left behind, they didn't the the, the native Irish they didn't <laughs> own that land, right? It was the Earl. Right. So they were tenants. They were, and they were sort of like tenants of tenants almost because the British government said, okay, you left, so now I own this land, because the Earls, of course, were sort of political figures as well. Um, and so, so they, they were the ones that, the Earls left, yeah. but the, the tenants were the ones that got moved to, like say, from Toronto to Donegal. Yeah, or, yeah, and they were, of course, again, it's, a, it's obviously got its stark differences, but it's, it is a similar idea to how Indian removal happened here, as you know, more and more European. Land's ownership in Ireland, and so even in Derry, it doesn't work out. Where does the tradition of land ownership go? Where does it come from and where does it go? Because there is no, I mean, from the way I understand mm -hmm. it, they're going back to the troubles. Right? Yeah. The land in Derry is in the home, belongs to the corporation. Right, yeah. So I mean, literally, I mean, and, and interestingly enough, um, and I believe, I know Dublin Cup, the idea, obviously, it wasn't the actual connection, but this idea of corporate government in terms of the London Derry Corporation or the Dublin Corporation that was the city council or the city government, like, of course, it evolved over time, but that was a direct link back to um, the establishment of the plantation in Derry, or it's you know similar to how, of course, they didn't last as long, but the East India Company that came here or went to um, the East Indies, um, and the British East India Company, the Dutch East India Company, these trade companies, primarily, of course, these places were so seen as hotspots for raw materials, for um, agriculture, which of course did require land and labor, so that's where that aspect came in, but it really wasn't much more than uh, like a commercial conquest. And so the idea was that, um, and especially in Derry, what happened is that, of course, Derry is an anglicization of the Irish name of the city, but some of the early settlers who came here got the London Corporation to finance them and said, hey, if you pay for us to establish something here, we will call the city London Derry. Um, and so it was another corporation government that did it. And of course, government has changed a lot. The British Empire changed a lot between the plantation and the troubles, but the, the, that was still sort of like a holdover from that time. And so um, they, of course, had always had all the power, so they made it have all, they made themselves have all the power. We see you know similar things with gerrymandering in our elections in this country and other places where people who may be a, minor, a minority but who have the means keep things so that they're always within their own community. Um, so, like for instance, um, I think a lot a lot later than us, although I can't remember the exact date, Britain abolished the idea that you had to own property to vote. Mm -hmm. But at the time, especially early in the Troubles, like Unionists could vote twice, but Catholics couldn't vote because they didn't have time to own their land. Mm -hmm. um, so some very perverse anti-democratic things happening there, um, which seemed shocking considering they were only maybe 50 years ago, 60 years ago that they were happening. But the idea of land ownership being linked to voting rights, of course, we do have some history of that here, and that's, of course, why in both Britain and in the U.S. for a long time, women couldn't vote because they weren't seen as people who were able to earn money and buy things and own land and manage things, but it does have a lot of links in this case back to the early 1600s. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm going to go here because I said that, and then I'll come to you. And it's just a quick okay. comment on the Cavan family, uh, that there were priests in many rural towns, yeah. but there really wasn't a formal church presence. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be very easy for yeah. intermarriages yeah. to, to happen. And I mean, some people um, had like one building, and like there's actually a, um, a few places that still do this, especially even in Scotland on some of the, the, the islands. There's like the village hall is the church. So at 11 a.m. it's the Methodist. At, at you know 12 p.m. it's the Presbyterians, etc. Yeah. Um, so you could just go there, and you'd probably see some people that you knew yeah. um, who would maybe be you know elders or leaders within your small community or within your small circles and say, okay. We'll officiate this wedding. Um, and that's a good point because the yeah. candle was was totally reduced to fat at first, right? And so, like they said, you know, by the eighteen hundreds, the Irish were the least catechized Catholics, yeah, ever. Right, well, like, but they didn't just have priests; they didn't, you know, go to mass regularly. They didn't receive communion, and most of them had these things, you know, that, like confirmed in yeah. the church. See, my great grandfather came over and, and settled in Easton. Okay. And they didn't have a complete yeah, church yeah. there yet, right? Mm -hmm. And so they waited for the uh, um, I'm pretty sure it was Augustinian mm -hmm. that came 
uh, maybe once a month or whatever. Yeah. And that's when they got married. Oh, yeah. And that's he, already, he, he named his first son, the middle name was Augustus. Oh, yeah. wow. That's interesting. Um, that's actually really interesting. Um, you see that a lot with um, when Ulster Scots migrated to America and talking about Presbyterianism, and it's very methodical and that sort of hardcore approach. Um, when Ulster Scots, who were, were some of the first Europeans to come to this area, started settling in places like um, the Appalachians or Pennsylvania or whatever, um, the plan was always that they had to send their clergy back to either Belfast or Glasgow to get educated, sometimes Edinburgh, um, because the Church of Scotland is the mother church and that's who teaches you how to preach. Um, but obviously when you're 3,000 plus miles away in um, the Pittsburgh area and there's no roads and there's no trains or whatever, very quickly, there actually was a schism um, about how how serious to take that within the Presbyterian Church, but ultimately actually a lot of people just moved to the Baptist Church because Baptists were like, yeah, we'll teach you right here yeah. and you're qualified, whereas hardcore Presbyterians um, did not accept that idea. So like even in my, my family, um, he died very, very young, but my grandfather was actually a pretty big deal minister up in Glen Falls. If anyone's from Glen Falls or has any family there, he was the Baptist minister in Glen Falls um, throughout the 50s and 60s. Um, and that's the side of my family that has Irish ancestry, but he was a Baptist. I've always known my dad said he's a Baptist, but the people that were coming over from Ireland were Anglican and Presbyterian. Mm. So, and they actually, dad's dad was from Virginia or from Pennsylvania, but their family had originally gone to Virginia, which was very heavy Anglican and sort of moved west to the more Ulster Scots, Scots-Irish, Appalachian area, Tennessee, Kentucky, Western North Carolina, where there were a lot of Presbyterians or perhaps um, Ben Baptists who had sort of cut ties with the old country just for expediency's sake. Speaking of land, yeah. uh, brought to mind the Ulster privilege, which is, you know, we think of the, the landlord owns everything mm -hmm. as manager because it, yeah. you're, you're just a tenant. Yeah. But the Ulster privilege has the right to to own your lease. Yeah. And then pass it on to your children. It's almost it's a, a form of ownership for people who don't want to admit that they don't own everything. Yeah. No. That, that's the way the Van Rensselaers were. Yeah. And they let the me. Van yeah. Just could do all kinds of privileges as long as you pay up, but they like to say we own the land. Yeah, and that actually, interestingly enough, in certain areas came back. I mean, not to fight the landlord's rights by any means, but um, a, a, a big factor for a lot of the Ulster Scots migration to this country um, was that a lot of landlords in Ulster were allowing people to do things like improve the land that they yeah. they worked. They could, you know, build stuff that they needed to better farm yeah. or bigger houses, etc. Um, but then the landlords are turning around and saying, okay, well, now my land's worth X much more, so you have to pay this much more in rent, mm -hmm. um, which is cool if you're making good money, but um, especially the late 1690s, interestingly enough, was a really bad time in Scotland and in Ireland for famine. Um, and Presbyterians themselves, although they are now seen as Protestant, of course, at the time, they were considered dissenters because they were not members of the state church. So while they were definitely above the Catholic population in social status, they were not the top of the, the, the lot, so to speak, the way the Anglicans were, so they still faced a, a bit of discrimination. Um, of course, not as bad as the Catholic population, but they were also, alongside the Catholics, prevented from holding any political office unless they took Anglican communion once a year, um, from advancing very far in sort of any social mobility scheme. Um, and that actually, for those who didn't migrate, um, was early on, up to about 1798, with the, the United Irishmen. That was a time of great solidarity between Catholics and Presbyterians because they had similar struggles and they wanted similar outcomes. And then sort of after 1798, when the British government came back and offered Presbyterians a better deal, they were like, okay, fine, our lot's gotten better, so we're fine with this. Whereas of course the Catholic population was continuously punished. Um, but like the United Irishmen themselves were founded among Presbyterians um, and was a largely Presbyterian movement. And, um, worked in solidarity and even sort of later on after the, the turn of the eight, uh, 19th century, like there were still Presbyterians who worked in things like tenant right law and land reform because they still had some of these sort of holdovers from uh, the plantation given their Presbyterian faith. Mm -hmm. And for a while there, things were actually not great, obviously, but they were pretty good between the Catholic population and the Presbyterian population. But as we all know, the British Empire's sort of MO was always divide and conquer. Right. So when they could siphon off the Presbyterians and, you know, elevate them alongside the Anglican population, stuff changed and all of a sudden this solidarity of these wars didn't seem to matter because part of it is of course just a matter of self-preservation, your own life's gotten better, so what do you care? But then of course that really just added another dimension to the religious strife. Mm 